president to try to save him from the more extreme voices uh, that were pushing uh, discredited and baseless legal theories to try to overturn the election. And the president didn't, uh, in, some, in many cases, rejected uh, the more sober advice from the people uh, on his staff to embrace uh, sort of conspiracy-minded voices from Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, and others. And then we uh, got a clear uh, sort of clear documentation that the president's uh, drop-in that suggested that even he would go to the Capitol on January 6th was, in fact, premeditated. Uh, there had been some reporting on that, but now we, uh, the committee brought the receipts. Uh, that is the sort of thing that helps uh, sort of you know, paint the, uh, the events of that day with a lot more clarity and resolution. Um, and, and, you know, there's, not, there's a lot less supposition. It's really all there in the record. Yeah, Major, let me turn to you. Um, as we've been watching this, we talked in the past about how the committee is really trying to sort of connect the dots here and yeah. establish what was happening behind closed doors in the West Wing and in other places in Washington in those days leading up to January 6th. Did anything that you heard today surprise you? A couple of things, and one of them that Zeke just mentioned. This idea now firmly established by evidence developed by the January 6th committee that the president had this secret plan that he didn't want anyone to know about spontaneously deciding to go to the Capitol after his speech on the ellipse. That was not spontaneous. That was part of a plan that existed at least a day before January 6th. That's significant. Also, his phone conversations with Steve Bannon, who was at the Willard Hotel, very near the White House, in his own war room. That also speaks to premeditation and collaboration with those who were not only trying to create a crowd, have a crowd that was knowingly armed and would in all probability be violent. This all goes to what could a reasonable person, any reasonable person, but especially the president of the United States, with an obligation to protect the Congress, protect the country and protect civil order, what would he reasonably have a belief to know might occur on January 6th? And what did he do to stop it? We have mounting evidence that the president had every reason to know, expect and believe there would be a large crowd, it would be violent, and it could do violent things to stop an official proceeding. And what did he do with that knowledge? Aid and abet it. Mm -hmm. That is what the committee, I think, made searingly clear today. Yeah. And Sean, I want to turn to you now because we did hear little bits and pieces from former White House counsel Pat Cipollone from his closed door testimony for the first time today. We are going to hear more uh, in the next hearing. but. What kind of insight did we gain from what we did see of his testimony? And do you think we learned as much as we expected? Well, I mean, one notable thing is the fact that he said in this testimony that, you know, uh, he had pushed uh, the president to uh, concede the election at a time that came well before what happened on January 6th. And we actually heard from a series of people inside the White House who made the case that, look, you know, it was not as if this president at that time was not getting information from people who were working for him, um, basically saying that there was no path forward. We saw these White House aides zero in on December 14th, which was a key date when electors gathered. Um, and that was seen, uh, according to this testimony that we saw today that was played on video by these White House aides, including one who, who uh, told this to the president directly, according to his testimony, that, look, this was it. This was sort of the end of the line. And so I think we we established, at least based on this testimony, um, that the president did hear from people inside the White House, people who were very, very close to him, who tried to make clear to him that there was not a path forward. And I think the committee's point in presenting that information um, from Cipollone and from others is to say, look, this president knowingly moved ahead anyway, tried to move ahead to try to overturn this election, knowing uh, what other people had told him. The whole point of today's hearing was to establish intent on the part of this president um, to stoke this attack on the Capitol. We've seen in previous hearings details about what happened that day, some other uh, officials and how they conducted themselves. But, you know, this is a very, very significant moment in this series of hearings because it was a very, very clear point today. And that point was to establish uh, on the part of the president an intent and knowledge about what exactly he was doing. Nicole Killian is with us as well, our CBS News congressional correspondent. Um, Nicole, it was interesting, Tanya mentioned these sort of snippets of testimony that we heard from Pat Cipollone's closed-door testimony last week. Um, we know that 
no topics were supposedly off limits per se, but it was interesting to hear that during the course of this hearing and the snippets that were released, Pat Cipollone seemed to suggest he was not going to specifically discuss any of President Trump's um, conversations, that he wasn't going to go into detail about what President Trump may or may not have said. Yeah, and uh, what we learned uh, through his testimony, though, was that he was actually, you know, quite candid about just, you know, the general tone and tenor of some of the conversations that were happening in and around the White House uh, in the run-up to January 6th. And, uh, you know, what was uh, really critical uh, was that you heard, in essence, uh, Pat Cipollone kind of backing up previous testimony that we have heard from other officials within the Trump administration whether that was Bill Barr, other White House uh, staff, other members of the White House Council in terms of, uh, you know, really believing that for the former president, there was no other path in terms of trying to overturn the election, that, uh, you know, he disagreed uh, pretty vehemently with this uh, idea of this Eastman theory that somehow the former vice president had the power to uh, overturn the results of the election unilaterally. He said, Said he did not believe the vice president had that authority. He also said uh, earlier on that he uh, believed and, and was told uh, by former uh, White House chief of staff Mark Meadows that uh, as early as late November uh, that he was told, uh, along with Bill Barr, that the former president would uh, perhaps kind of uh, graciously uh, make an exit, and yet uh, that didn't happen. Uh, so there were a number of different uh, facts it's a kind of of evolution in terms of, you know, kind of how this timeline and timetable and these various pressure campaigns evolved and, and the reaction uh, that Pat Cipollone had uh, to some of those, uh, including uh, some of those very heated meetings that we learned about, like that one uh, in mid-December mm -hmm. with uh, the former president, uh, as well as some of these informal outside advisors who kind of gained access to the White House, even though they really didn't have a formal appointment. You know, Pat Cipollone said he was kind of taken aback by that. He wasn't happy by that meeting, uh, which did become very contentious, as we learned through testimony today, that there was screaming and shouting involved in terms of discussing these various schemes to put possibly, you know, seize voting machines and appoint Sidney Powell, uh, one of the president's uh, informal advisors and, uh, the, you know, who was advising him on some legal matters. You know, Pat Cipollone disagreeing with that. He didn't think that she should be uh, appointed as any type of special counsel uh, and, again, uh, saw no valid reason uh, why someone would try to seize voting machines. So time and again, he really, uh, you know, objected uh, pretty strongly to these various plots and schemes that were being presented uh, to the former president. And uh, that's why I think you saw so many clips in this hearing. It was almost like he was a, one of the witnesses uh, testifying, if you will. Certainly there been a lot of buildup to his testimony, given the fact that he sat down with the committee for some eight hours last week. And certainly it sounds uh, from the committee that there will be more to come from him in their next hearing. Yeah, I mean, Nicole, to your point about Sidney Powell, you know, she's facing this lawsuit from Dominion uh, Voting Systems as, as well as Fox News. And one of her defenses is that no reasonable person would have believed what she was saying, which adds, you know, major something to the picture of chaos that we saw uh, developing within the White House according to the committee during those final days of the of the Trump administration and talking about that meeting that unhinged quote unhinged December 18th meeting in the Oval Office we just heard Nicole talking about what more do we know about what transpired that day well that meeting was written about by Patrick Byrne. You can find his book on Amazon. He wrote about this publicly four months ago. Patrick Byrne is the former CEO of Overstock.com. He was in that meeting alongside Sidney Powell and Michael Flynn, the president's former national security advisor. And they were giving the president this whole presentation about two executive orders, one from the Obama administration and one that he could sign that would give him the authority, they said, to send the military. They suggested the National Guard seize ba ballot boxes and rerun the election if necessary, if necessary, in six different states so he could retain power and get a second term. And everyone associated with the president, White House counsel Pat Cipollone, the attorney general, Eric Hirschman, all said that is, A, 
without any legal foundation. It's unconstitutional. There's no evidence to back it up. And this is chaos, yes, but it's chaos in pursuit of a specific cause. What was that specific cause? To keep President Trump in power without the will of the voters to support that, meaning to overturn an election and keep him in the presidency illegitimacy, illegitimately. That was their aim. And that's what this whole meeting was about. And as contentious as it was, as loud as it was, as full of invective and other kinds of language, the president only decided not to do it sort of after exhaustion. But he considered it and considered it seriously. And then after that meeting ended, he said, you know what? I'm going to put out a tweet because I know my supporters will respond more favorably than I could get a consensus in my own Oval Office or the residents of the White House. So I can't get a resolution here at the White House. I will try to find one by another means. Mm -hmm. And what was that other means? To mobilize a crowd, to come to the White House and use protest, some of it violent, to stop the certification on January 6th. So it was an outside means to solve what was, for his sake, and the cause of staying in office, an irresolvable internal problem. And that's the essence of what this story is about. So, Zeke, Major talks about the president at that time being unable to get a resolution inside the Oval Office. So the committee says that that, quote, un unhinged meeting is what led to former President Trump's overnight tweet, which they suggest was a call to arms for the January 6th insurrection. Remind us, Zeke, of the goal here when it comes to the committee sort of introducing us and taking us through those advisors who were not just within the West Wing, but outside advisors like that group who also comprised part of President Trump's inner circle and the, the attempt by this committee to connect them to those actions that we saw take place on January 6th. You know, as, as Major really laid out there, the committee's goal is to try to connect the dots between the, the uh, actions and decisions that took place in the White House and the president's inner circle that were then magnified and whipped up and led to the effect uh, to the events of January 6th, the violent insurrection um, at the Capitol in the attempt to overthrow the role of the American public and stop the election certification. Um, and, and that inside outside dynamic. And so that sort of was what we saw today. Uh, from the committee, uh, you know, taking uh, viewers inside that, that that December meeting where they were having you know that vitriolic fight uh, about what the president could do, um, what the committee has learned about the drafting of that president of the president's overnight tweet, uh, and then revealing that uh, one of the uh, the groups that that sponsored that event on the ellipse actually changed the permit and that was supposed to take place a couple of days after the scheduled inauguration of, of President Joe Biden to move it to January 6th in, in line with the president's tweet. Um, and then the, the knowledge that the committee has gathered about the president uh, using that as sort of a, you know, his, his plan that was sort of a sub Rosa plan to surprise rally goers with a, hey, let's all go over to the Capitol and mm -hmm. stop the counting of these electoral votes and the certification of the election in the way the American people voted. That's what the committee is trying to, is sort of trying to connect there. It's, uh, you know, that the actions that individual people in that mob took, that the groups that sponsored the event took, um, that the lawyers uh, around the president were taking, all stem back to the decisions uh, of the president himself mm -hmm. because he was upset uh, that he lost the election. And they're trying to con connect those dots there. A lot of American people sort of know this happened. And, and Sean, to Zeke's point there about connecting the dots, lawmakers uh, heard from the former spokesperson for the Oath Keepers, one of the militia groups the panel is trying to connect uh, to some of former Trump, President Trump's allies. So he briefly explained the group's ultimate vision and how dangerous these groups are and could be. Let's listen to what he said. I think we saw a glimpse of what the vision of the Oath Keepers is on January 6th. Um, it doesn't necessarily include the rule of law. It doesn't necessarily include, um, it, it includes violence. It includes trying to, to get their way through lies, through deceit, 
through intimidation and through the, the perpetration of violence, the swaying of, of people who may not know better through lies and rhetoric and propaganda. And so, Sean, how successful do you think the House Select Committee was in not just linking the former president's inner circle, but perhaps even the president himself to these far-right extremist groups? Yeah, I think what, what the committee tried to do today was present pretty direct evidence of what happened after pr the president at the time issued that tweet in late December where he said there was going to be a big protest in D.C. on January 6th will be wild. And they tried to trace very, very specific things, very, very direct things that happened in the aftermath. You know, we saw evidence that there was one group that didn't even intend on being uh, in the Capitol area on January 6th who changed their plans as a result of that. We heard from a rioter who participated in this violent attack on the Capitol by a pro-Trump mob say explicitly that he was motivated to go there because of what he heard from, at that time, President Trump on social media. Um, you know, we heard, uh, uh, you know, other uh, pieces of evidence that was presented at this hearing. Um, you know, one online Trump supporter talking about a, quote, red wedding, which was an apparent reference to, you know, violence. Um, and so I think what this mm -hmm. committee set out to do today was to say, look, here's a tweet that the president put out. And here are some very, very specific things that happened in that aftermath. Here are some people who followed uh, that tweet with very, very specific actions, in some cases uh, attending this violent attack, in some cases uh, spreading violent rhetoric uh, online. And so, you know, I think they sought out to be very, very specific in what they were presenting today on that front and how that's connected specifically to the president's words, not necessarily just the White House or what they were saying at the time, but specifically President Trump and what he was saying on social media that at, at that period of time. Um, Major, at the very end of the hearing, as we've mentioned, Congresswoman Cheney hinted uh, about possible witness tampering. Let's listen to what she said. After our last hearing, President Trump tried to call a witness in our investigation, a witness you have not yet seen in these hearings. That person declined to answer or respond to President Trump's call and instead alerted their lawyer to the call. Their lawyer alerted us. I mean, Major, that was quite the revelation. Mm -hmm. um, what are the potential implications there? Witness tampering, obstruction of justice. Very simple. You can't do this. It is an official congressional proceeding. Some close to the former president have suggested it's not taken that argument to court, lost repeatedly. This is a legitimate congressional committee with a mandate to conduct an investigation with all the powers accorded to Congress in pursuit of that investigation. One of those is subpoena power. Also, anyone that is a witness before a committee of this nature ought not to be tampered with. And that is the implication of a call from the former president. And that was raised in a previous hearing that there might have been ever, ever, efforts by former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows to do the same. So this is beginning to create a pattern. It also suggests something that those in the Trump world very much like to try to suggest to the American public. They're not watching. Nobody's watching. This is having no impact. A call from the former president to a potential witness who has not yet appeared tells you that is 100 percent false, mm -hmm. that the former president is watching, that those close to him know that this is bleeding him. The polling data suggests that this is having an effect. And this entire story told principally, if not entirely, by Republicans and those who worked in the Trump White House is having a materially negative effect on the president as all this evidence continues to pile up. Yeah, it is powerful to hear this testimony directly from people who worked under the former president. So, Nicole, where does the House Select Committee go from here? What's next? We do know we still have to hear more from Pat Cipollone. Uh, there was that witness that we don't know who that is that we just heard turned down the call from former President Trump. Um, could uh, Liz Cheney have been referring to Pat Cipollone? Who do you think she may have been referring to there? You know, I don't want to speculate at this point simply because the committee has interviewed so many witnesses. But um, we do know, obviously, that the next hearing that they intend to have, which could happen uh, as soon as next week, is really aimed at focusing 
on what happened January 6th. What happened in that 187 minutes from the time the riot started to when the former president sent out that message telling his supporters ultimately to go home. And so, uh, so many questions uh, the committee has had throughout the course of its investigation as to what the former president was doing, what was his state of mind, how was he responding. And so we really expect that to uh, really be the crux of that next upcoming hearing. And as you heard Chairman Benny Thompson say, you know, in the view of the committee, they, in essence, believe that uh, the former president uh, was was derelict in his duty. And so I think that really will be kind of the main point you will hear coming out of that future hearing. Uh, we do know ultimately as uh, the committee wraps up this round of hearings for this summer uh, that it's possible uh, they could hold another one at, at some point later down the line. Uh, obviously, they're continuing to work on a report uh, that will be released uh, likely at some point uh, in the fall uh, prior to the midterms, uh, we would expect. And, and their ultimate goal, too, is to look at potential legislative remedies and uh, recommendations coming out of all of this testimony. So that is kind of the short term and long term plans uh, for the committees in the weeks and months to come. All right, Nicole, Sean, Zeke and Major, thanks to all of you. Lots to unpack from today and lots more to come. We appreciate you being with us. And we are going to take a short break, but now is a good time to remind you, you can stay up to date by downloading our CBS News app. You're streaming CBS News always on. CBS News Sunday Morning with Jane Pauley on CBS. You ready? A generation of kids opens up on CBS Reports. I just want to be 